Behold this child is set for the fall and the resurrection of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be contradicted. And thine own soul a sword shall pierce, that out of many hearts thoughts may be revealed. Words taken from the gospel for this Sunday within the octave of Christmas, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. At Christmas, His Majesty Jesus Christ opened up a pathway for man to return to heaven. The scholastics, those great medieval doctors and thinkers, like to describe it in terms of exitus, a going out, followed by a reditus, a return. Exitus, reditus. But the going out for His Majesty was, first of all, down. As we heard in the introit for the Mass this morning, while all things were in quiet silence, and the night was in the midst of her course, thine almighty word, O Lord, leaped down from heaven, from thy royal throne. He came to the Virgin, as we know, was made the incarnate word, and he was born for all to know, to love, and to adore at midnight on Christmas. But as we know, he would descend even further. In his passion and in his death, he went down into the underworld below, below the surface of the earth, to the limbo of the fathers. And some would even hold that he went so far as to harrow hell itself, letting him know he was the master and king of the whole entire universe. Yet he came back up again, just as he left the womb untouched, retaining the seal of virginity. So too, he rose again from the dead and left the tomb sealed and empty. Then 40 days later, his majesty made his glorious return into heaven with our human nature. What a pathway. Exodus, Oreditus, a going down, a going out and down in order to come up and back again. Now, if you recall our discussion of the Pacific salmon fish, that is what they do too. They leave the home waters of some clear stream up in the mountains and they go down and down to the ocean only to make their way back up again to die in the same place to bring forth life. Now, it seems to me this pattern is repeated often in the lives of the saints. The Israelites, they had to go down into Egypt before they could come out again with a great victory at the Red Sea. Still a marvel for us today, isn't it? They had to again descend in the desert until the time was right to cross the Jordan for yet another astounding victory before they could climb up the mountain and establish the temple in Jerusalem. After working long to overcome evil in Israel and striving to help the wicked king Achab come to his senses, St. Elias finally went out into the desert and offered himself up in death. He was ready to give it up, give up everything. Take my life, he said, O Lord, I am no better than my father's. It was the lowest point of his life. Yet before long, he was riding a fiery chariot up into the heavens. Tobias, the elder, and Sarah both gave themselves up unto death, offering their life back to God so unbearable. So unbearable had their situation become. They were at the lowest point of their lives with even those under them mocking them and rejecting them. Yet before long, having gone down so low, they came out and enjoyed blessings unforeseen. If you remember, Tobias was blinded and he received his sight back. Sarah had lost seven husbands and now had a husband that was faithful. After his majesty was transfigured on Mount Tabor, he had to go down into the valley in order to go back up by way of Jerusalem to the mountain of Calvary and ultimately to ascend back to heaven on the mountain of Olivet. As we mentioned on Christmas morning, the victim soul, St. Lydwin, 
fell on the ice at 15 and ended up on a bed of pain for 38 years, this 15th century saint, after four years of trials and near despair and seeking a cure or an answer to her mysterious illnesses, she finally gave way to meditating upon the passion. She rose up out of her chrysalis of horror to become a butterfly of amazing power and beauty. Before long, she could descend into purgatory or fly to some church of Christendom or even up into Eden itself. When she died, her diseased and decrepit body turned into a young, perfectly formed lady with no marks of her diseases or long illnesses. St. Isaac Jogues comes to mind. He left his native land of France to help the pagan Indians of North America. After receiving very harsh treatment from the Mohawks and escaping near death, even having his fingers bitten off, he went back down. He went back down and was recaptured by the same tribe, only to be brutally martyred by them. He flew home to his heavenly reward, bringing many souls with him, including... Kateri Tekakwitha. Souls, upon receiving judgment after they die, gladly throw themselves down into purgatory in order to be cleansed and rise up again as purified saints, so the mystics tell us. I think Dante, 14th century poet, put this pattern on display in his Divine Comedy. In the first canto of Dante's Divine Comedy, we find a most fascinating scene. Dante writes, Midway upon the journey of our life, I found that I was in a dusky wood, for the right path whence I had strayed was lost. Dante is in a place of confusion and disorientation. He seems to be in a state of sin. He doesn't say it, but it's obvious. Ah, me, he says, how hard a thing it is to tell the wildness of that rough and savage place. The very thought of which brings back my fear. So bitter it was, death is little more so. He's in a place of death and darkness. He goes on, how I arrived there, it were hard to tell. So weary was my mind, so filled with sleep, I reeled and wandered from the path of truth. As a little confession there. So due to sin and all the evil around him, he lived in uh, the 14th century Florence, Italy, which was in war around that time. He became desensitized. He was blinded to the truth and walked off the right path. It would almost seem that Dante were writing about our times. So many sin to find relief, indulge their passions to escape the pains of the world. Dante next explains how he came to a mountain upon which the sun was shining near the upper reaches. He knew that he must climb up there to overcome all his problems and find peace. For up there was light and truth. In other words, peace, joy, and happiness. He had to climb out of the valley of diabolical disorientation. That comes about with sin. Yet when he tried to climb, he could not. He was helplessly stuck down in the wild valley, a sort of deep ditch. He says, again, I started up the desert steep when lo, close to the bottom of the mount, a leopardess, light poised and passing swift, all her hide covered over with inky spots. She always stood before me face to face, blocking my path wherever I advanced, so that I turned and turned again in vain. This leopard here symbolizes lust. He could not free himself from sin by his own efforts. He needed help. As the day grew, he tried again. He said, the time of day, the soft air of the season emboldened me to hope I might prevail against the beast with the gaily spotted hide, but not enough to overcome my fear when I beheld a lion in my path. He seemed, as it were, advancing on me, his head erect, by rabid hunger driven, 
so that the very air did seem afraid. The lion is pride. The one who is lacking in humility easily falls into presumption and grasps for various false hopes. And we can think of shortcuts. False hopes are almost always shortcuts to the solution to our problems. How many times in our life have we taken shortcuts and, oh, did it cost us? How many think here there is some easy way to solving the world's problems or their own personal issues? New technology, drugs, economics, strong defenses, politics, whatever. New political parties. We've been through it all. A new pope. Dante continues, a she-wolf stood beside him, gaunt and grim, whose leanness showed her hunger unappeased, though many she caused to live in woe. So we have a leopardess, a lion, and a she-wolf. The wolf is avarice. St. John, the beloved apostle, covers these three beasts in his first letter. He says, all that is in the world... The lust of the flesh, the leopard, the lust of the eyes, the wolf, and the pride of life, the lion. Maybe these particular beasts do not exactly match our own situation, but often there are similar things blocking our easy ascent of the mountain. The important thing is not to despair. Due to these beasts, Dante almost gives up on making the ascent. When the false hopes fail, one is easily open to giving up and living a life of self-indulgence. What's the use? I just want to feel good. But Dante cries out for help, and heaven hears his plea. The poet Virgil is sent to help him out. But to reach the top of the mountain where the light of heaven shines, he must first see something of what sin is about, and start paying his debts. He must first go down. To her hell. And then pass beyond his confines. And make his way up a seven storied mountain. For the seven deadly sins. And this is purgatory. Only then can he make it to heaven. Alas. I hope you see the point. It seems that once stubborn man has fallen into the ditch. And we're there. Nothing else will serve to liberate him. At least liberate him wholly from the forces of evil about him that his sin has unleashed upon the world and upon himself. But to see their final consequences. I think that's what God's doing now. You need to taste the final consequences of your ideas and your sins. It seems man must drink of the foaming and spicy chalice For some, they must drink it, sadly, to the dregs. We're in one of those Dante-like times in our own world. We have been here for a while, need it be said. It can be confusing as to its causes and its solutions. But the pathway is not a simple ascent. As the third secret of Fatima, and the part that was revealed to us, that is, shows there's a time of confusion that's going to happen. We're in it, with few making the ascent up and out. But that will change, presumably, after enough people, from the Pope on down, take up the cry of heaven to do penance, penance, penance which we've proven is none other than our duties of our state in life, as our Lord mentioned to Sister Lucia. The important part for us is this. We need to do our going down now while we have a chance. Do We need to do our penance, penance, penance to undo our sins and the debts they cause and of those of the world around us. Let's embrace ahead of time the crosses of this coming year, the physical ailments we may suffer, the miscommunications and disagreeable people we have to live with and work with, the temptations the devil may throw at us, and he's going to throw some. 
Nay, even all the world around us may send our way. Wicked weather, dumb or even diabolical decisions of governing bodies, failing economics, and all that may happen in this fallen world. The saints did this, and so can we. They saw everything as coming from the hand of God for their own good and for the good of the world around them, saying always, I deserve this for my sins. They were able to descend into a hell, as it were, in order to rise up and fly to heaven. As we heard in the gospel, this indeed is the path taken by his majesty and his holy mother. It's a sign of contradiction through which many will receive a resurrection, but many will fail. Let's follow and we will indeed find the home waters of life, the home waters of our very existence. The long desired peace, joy and happiness will only be found there. And one could argue one can only find it by following this path. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. St. John of the Cross exclaims, Where there is no love, put love, and you will draw out love. Where there is no love, put love, and you will draw out love. Here's an easy way to see what God is doing at Christmas. He looked down upon the world and found it forsaken, without love. He found the world selfish and self-seeking, at war within and at war without. Thus, he sent down love, divine charity. This divine love became incarnate in the womb of the Blessed Virgin. And everywhere she went, she brought this incarnate love. Remember the child's song, Mary had a little lamb. His fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. St. John the Baptist received this love and leapt in the womb for joy. Both his parents, Elizabeth and Zacharias, were likewise grace-filled and prophesied. St. Joseph was filled with divine love too, such that we could say that all of them were wounded, smitten by the love of God, and they never recovered. They wanted nothing more than to give back love for love, even their very lives. In this way, God drew out love from the world. No wonder then St. John of the Cross poetically exclaimed, my sweet and tender Jesus, if thy love can slay, it is today, Christmas. If thy love can kill, it's today. Die of love for the divine love that has come down. Now this divine love became visible in our fallen world at midnight on Christmas. In complete fulfillment of the scriptures, when half spent was the night, the word, the mighty word, leapt down from heaven. This divine love allowed itself to be confined to our human nature, to be bound in swaddling clothes, swaddling bands, to be placed in a manger, in a cave-like stable in the cold of night. This says something about true charity, what it looks like, divine love. It is first and foremost self-sacrificing, self-giving. It pours itself out for the beloved one. Listen again to another poetic expression of St. John of the Cross. When the time had come for him to be born, he went forth like the bridegroom from his bridal chamber, embracing his bride. Who is the bride? Our human nature. Holding her in his arms, whom the gracious mother laid in a manger among some animals that were there at the time. Men sang songs and angels' melodies celebrated the marriage of two such as these, the divine and the human nature wed in one person. 
the hypostatic union. This is the wedding. But God there in the manger cried and moaned. And these tears were jewels the bride brought to the wedding. The mother gazed in sheer wonder on such an exchange. In God, man's weeping. And in man, gladness. To the one and the other, things usually so strange. Thank you, St. John of the Cross. What an exchange, what a reversal. Think about it. God's always happy. And now he's crying. We're always sad and complaining and miserable. And now we're glad. What an exchange, what a reversal. After teaching his disciples the Our Father, His Majesty, Jesus Christ, the Incarnate Word, tells them a parable about a man knocking on his neighbor's door at midnight. Interesting, huh? At midnight on behalf of a friend who had just arrived on a journey. This friend is the divine friend that arrives at midnight on a journey. Now, St. Luke in his gospel makes it very clear that the journey is heading toward Jerusalem. The divine friend that's arrived is heading toward some place. He's heading to Jerusalem where he will make his exodus from this world. Remember, he's on a journey. He's going to make his exodus by way of Calvary and ultimately Mount Olivet to ascend back to where he came from, heaven. When he came, love came into the world. The truth is preached. Man is filled with grace. Demons are cast out. In fact, the next scene in St. Luke's Gospel, after the parable about the man knocking at midnight, is about a demon being cast out. Diseases are dispelled and the dead are raised. What does the Lord get out of all this? He has married our lowly human nature, symbolized by the constraining bands of the swaddling clothes. We are glad, and he cries. Later, he would be constrained by the nails of the cross. It's precisely why I'm wearing this gold vestment today, with the crucifixion on the back. Just as he's on this cross, so is he in the manger. He's constrained by the nails of the cross and then by the appearances of bread and wine in the Eucharist on our altars and in our tabernacles until the very end of time. This divine love that none, absolutely none of the false religions in the world can match. And that itself is a sign that this is the only one. This is where love is. It sacrifices itself for the loved one. It makes the journey to Calvary. This is God's gift of his love to us so that we can love him and each other in return. He cries so we can rejoice. Without this divine infusion into us and the world, we're not able to be truly charitable. And you can tell when someone gets away from God. Because they're not able to be charitable. With this infusion, we can do what he did. Where there is no love, we can put love and draw out love. Now a scene from the life of the victim soul, St. Lydwin of Shedham, Belgium, displays all this oh so very well. She lived in the early 1400s. After a skating accident at 15 years of age, she was very pretty, very beautiful. She lived 38 years after the skating accident, 38 years on a bed of pain and suffering. She never rose from it on her own. And this bed very much resembled a manger made of wood and filled with straw. She ate something like three days worth of food over 38 years and would not die. She couldn't eat. Only the Eucharist. That's all she could eat. And the priest hardly ever brought it to her. You thought you had problems. She suffered almost every illness and disease of the day except leprosy. And this is all very well documented. You can read about it. Thomas Akempis was one of her biographers. Now, keep in mind, 
She could not die, apparently, from all this. The Lord had designated her to make reparation and expiation for the sins of her day. But keep in mind, the saint represents our poor, fallen human race, our sick, debilitated human nature. She was blind in one eye. She could not move one of her arms. She could not roll over in bed or move on her own. She would literally fall apart. They had to wrap her up in sheets in order to move her, lest she fall apart. In a way, this is the bride that Christ married in the womb of the virgin that made him moan and cry. On Christmas Day, the Lord deigned to come and visit St. Lydwin on her bed of pain. Just before he arrived, angels came and touched her such that she came out of her yellow disease chrysalis, her caterpillar-like chrysalis. With all her womanly beauty like a butterfly, she came out and her health returned to her. This is what the coming of Christ can do, and this is what it did. When the angels entered, they held the instruments of the passion, the cross, the nails, the hammer, the lance, the column, the thorns, and the scourge. And one by one, they ranged themselves in a semicircle in the room, leaving an empty space around the bed. This is how God greets a saint. These are his Christmas presents. The instruments of the passion. The angels flamed in draperies of fire bordered by shining orphreys and flowers of fabulous gems flashed upon the moving fire of their robes. They suddenly all bowed. Someone greater than them was coming. The virgin advanced accompanied by a magnificent following of saints crowned with flaming halos. Blessed Mary, dressed simply in a robe of white flames, carried gems in the tresses of her hair, whose facets unknown amongst the jewels of the earth, burnt with dazzling light. Any other than Lydwin would have been unable to bear the overpowering brightness of this sight. And the virgin smiled, while as the infant Jesus advanced, And sitting upon the edge of the bed, spoke tenderly to his lied one. See what happens when we open the door to St. Joseph knocking at midnight for the divine friend. Our lady will come and the lamb will be sure to follow. For lied one, the knocking went on for four years. If you know her story, four years his majesty knocked at her door. And she finally gave in and started to meditate upon the passion and understand why she was on a bed of pain made of wood and straw. Returning now to Christmas Day with Lydwin, suddenly the soul of the saint was melted with excessive joy. But the holy child extended his arms and was transformed into a man. The face was disfigured. The hollow cheeks were furrowed with livid scars. The crown of thorns rose above the forehead. The red drops ran down from the points. The feet and hands developed wounds and a bluish halo encircled the feverish marks. Calvary succeeded the stable of Bethlehem without perceptible transition, says her biographer. And Jesus crucified was substituted in an instant for Jesus the babe. And this surely is why St. John of the Cross said the babe was crying and moaning. Lydwin was beatified and ravished and harrowed at the same time. Ravished to be at last in the presence of the well-beloved. Harrowed that he was martyred in this way. She laughed and cried at one and the same time. When the wounds of Christ darted upon her luminous rays which transformed her feet, her hands, and her heart. She had the stigmata. This is the fulfillment of the saint's desire to return love for love in a heroic manner. She asked that it be hidden stigmata so that she would not receive any praise, that her love would remain pure. 
Then the Blessed Virgin took respectfully from the hands of the angels the instruments of the Passion and made Lydwin kiss them one after the other. And immediately after her mouth had touched them, they vanished away. You get it? When we embrace our cross and we love them, they start to get easy and disappear. Then Jesus changed and became an infant again, but he remained nailed to the cross even as a child of which his size had diminished uh, with his own stature, but the cross diminished with him. Lydwin was fainting with grief, but the holy child, can you imagine seeing the holy child crucified? Who wouldn't be ravished? Who wouldn't be harrowed at such a sight? But the holy child was transfigured and smiled upon her. So that she cried, I thank you, my Savior, that you have condescended to visit your poor servant. She thanked him for being able to suffer with him and for him. Love was drawing out love. Then lied when the young and beautiful butterfly wrapped herself again in the chrysalis of horror. The glorious body of the virgin and her angels vanished. Jesus rose and began to become invisible. When afflicted at his departure, the saint cried, Savior, if thou art truly he whom I believe, prove to me before thy departure that I am not the victim of an illusion. Do not abandon me without leaving me a sure indication that it is thou and not another who is here. At these words, Jesus clothed himself in a new form and Lywin perceived Floating above her head, the sacred host. At the same instant, a white cloth descended upon her pallet, and the sacred host gently placed itself there. All in the house came and adored the host and saw on it the image of a child crucified. It is a fact that the saint could not keep down any ordinary food or bread. Only Holy Communion. The pastor finally came and gave her this host in Holy Communion. And she knew with certainty, the certainty the sacraments and faith give us, that it indeed was the Lord. Does not this scene capture the true meaning of Christmas? It is a gift of divine charity, sacrificial love for the redemption of the world that calls upon us to love in return. To open our doors and invite in divine love in our lives. So that it will transform us, our homes, our families, our marriages, our city, our country, our world. I'm sure some of us are in a chrysalis of our, some unwanted situation. We feel wrapped up in swaddling bands. We cannot escape. We don't have to get the stigmata to return love for love. Very few receive such a privilege. But we do have to rise from our self-love and open the door which sin and lack of faith keeps closed and give our poor, paltry nature back to His majesty. Kiss the instruments of the passion. Love your cross and they will get light and disappear. Look in the manger and see a little boy with arms outstretched Longing to enter our homes. He's knocking. Lift your eyes to the crucified over the altar. Here is the same little boy that is in the crib with tears in his eyes, hands outstretched, wanting only that we open the door to him to be picked up, to be picked up and loved in return. Is there really any difference between the love asked in the cradle made of wood And that on the wood of the cross, except for the size of the man. The message is clearly love, divine love, sacrificial love. From the day of his birth to the day of his death. Where there is no love, put love and you will draw out love. God has put divine love here in this time and place. What is our response? 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. When John had heard in prison the works of Christ, sending two of his disciples, he said to him, Art thou he that art to come, or look we for another? Words taken from the Gospel today. For the second Sunday of Advent, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Naturally, man seeks his origins. It's part of his nature. He wants to know his origins. Even nature around us, creation around us, does the same. Water evaporated into the sky reaches a point where it must come back down to earth in rain, sleet, or snow. The Pacific salmon fish, fantastic fish, Out west, goes out into the Pacific Ocean from the clear streams of the west. And it puts this on display, this returning to its origins like no other in creation. After living in the salt water of the open ocean for something like three years, this amazing fish longs to return home to the clear and fresh waters of some mountain stream making its return an all-or-nothing affair, overcoming obstacles as high as 10 feet, rapids, bears, and everything else, swimming up to a 1,000 miles, discerning exactly, precisely, the smell of their home waters. They must find and know their origins before they can bring forth new life and die. There it is. It's in the nature of things to seek its origin. Adopted children are similarly driven to find and meet their parents as if a part of their life were missing. In a way, most of the Holy Bible is about origins. Who gave birth to who? How far back can I trace this or that? The Gospels begin with St. Matthew's genealogy, tracing the origins of his majesty through David back to Abraham, our father in faith. St. Luke traces his majesty's human nature back to Adam himself and then to God, saying, chapter 3 of Luke, who was of Adam, who was of God. In other words, Christ Jesus is the source of man's salvation That's what Luke is saying. No matter when and where man lives, he is our origin, our exemplar. As Venerable Mother Mary of Agreda says in the mystical city of God, Jesus and Mary are the great originals in view of whom Adam and Eve were created. There's icons showing this even. Old icons, not new ones. Literally centuries upon centuries old showing that Adam was made in view of the Christ. Interesting. The great originals are really Jesus and Mary. And so, for members of the mystical body of Christ, we also find our spiritual origin, our headwaters, in the waters of baptism instituted by Christ himself. In other words, our origin is the side of Christ on Calvary, with his mother standing there, suffering as co-redemptrix to give us birth. As we read in the Apocalypse, being with child, she cried travailing in birth and was in the pain to be delivered because we are in sin. She had a painless birth for her son, Jesus Christ. But for us, we're in sin, it's painful. She gives birth to us at baptism. Thus, St. Ignatius prays in the Anima Christi his famous prayer, in thy wounds I long to hide never to be parted from thy side. May I never leave your church. May I never forget the origin of grace. St. John the Baptist certainly understood something of this need of man's nature to know his origin. It was connected to his duty to point out the origin of origins when he cried out saying, this was he of whom I spoke. He that shall come after me is preferred before me. Why? Because he was before me. Even though he was conceived six months later. He was before me. Interesting. 
The great forerunner was trying to get his disciples to do the same as he had done. Seek out their true origins and stop following him. Thus the ruse he, we, we read about in the gospel, we heard in the gospel today. When the Pharisees questioned our Lord as to who he was, saying, Who art thou? In John chapter 8, our Lord responded simply this, The beginning. Who art thou? The beginning, who also speak unto you. Thus, St. John the Baptist did well in today's gospel to send his misled disciples to the Christ to see for themselves this truth. For unlike the salmon fish, they took a wrong turn in following him, the precursor, instead of seeking their true origins. Yet like the salmon fish, once one finds their true origin, they find the fountain, the home waters of life. Notice then how his majesty responds to the disciples of St. John. And Jesus, making answer, said to them, Go and relate to John what you have heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear. The dead rise again. Here's life. So much life that death can't even say no to him. He said, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Is this not a fulfillment of the Proverbs chapter 8? We heard yesterday in the Immaculate Conception. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways. Before he made anything from the beginning, I was set up from eternity. He that shall find me shall find life. Proverbs chapter 8. Did not he himself exclaim that he was indeed the way, the truth, and the life, without whom we can do nothing? St. John, the beloved disciple, says of the Christ in the Apocalypse, Thus says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, who is the beginning of the creation of God. When we do find our origins, once again, it is part of our nature to honor, to respect, and to give thanks to them and venerate them. So it's our nature to want to know our origins. It's in our nature to want to honor them, to respect them, to give thanks to them, and to venerate them. Thus, we have the fourth commandment, to honor our mother and our father. And this holds not just for our immediate biological parents, our biological origins in our parents, but even more for our spiritual father and mothers, including priests, bishops, popes, and our holy mother, the church. They all cooperated in some way to bring us into existence. And more importantly, spiritual existence. To give this honor, to give this honor and thanks and veneration is an act according to our nature and the supernatural life of grace. So we're body, soul, and spirit, and all those various origins have a part in all those levels. We have to honor them and respect them and venerate them accordingly to their position according to their position. So when St. John the Baptist spoke of our Lord and Savior, his origin, what did he exclaim? But I indeed baptize you with water, but there shall come one mightier than I, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to lose. He's venerating him already. He's honoring him. He's respecting him. He's humiliating himself before him. And he says, he must increase and I must decrease. He was acting according to his nature. Now, on the first day of creation, the angels were tested. They were made and they were tested. And light was separated from darkness. And how were they tested? They were tested by seeing the origin and the cause of their grace and source of their future glory. They gazed upon their origins. In other words, they gazed upon Jesus and Mary, for they too needed them. Those who discerned among the angels found the home waters of eternal life. They made it home. The angels who rejected them failed to swim home, finding eternal death instead. Thus, once again, Proverbs chapter 8, all that hate me love death. I bring this to your attention today because I want you to notice something that's been happening more and more in our times. 
Namely, there has been much dishonoring and disrespecting of our origins. Our parents, our ancestors are belittled. Our priests and our bishops and popes are wrongly challenged. Even sad to say, our Holy Mother Church. And as Halloween shows, there is much loving of death all around us. And it's happening on a broader and broader scale and more boldly, too. How is it that so many people are able to act contrary to their nature? Yes, it is true. There are scandals and there's many other things like failed parenthood, failed priesthood. Failed bishops and cardinals and popes too. But his majesty said that would sadly always happen and be around. You can't escape it. How is it that so many are not acting according to their nature and to the supernatural demands of piety to honor those from whom they owe their origin? Remember the salmon fish? For them, it was an all or nothing affair. It's an amazing event in nature to watch the salmon make their way home. It's an all or nothing affair. And that is indeed what is needed. If anyone is to swim home and drink from the fountains of life in times like these, especially. It seems clear to me that one of the root causes of this Failure to live according to our nature is that for over a century or more now, our origins have been steadily questioned and obscured under the cloud of evolutionary pseudo fake science. Obscuring of origins is precisely what evolution does. Whence man comes suddenly becomes unknown, speculative, hypothetical. Everything becomes confused, fluid and up for grabs. It's whatever you want it to be. Propose a theory. Write a paper about it. Make a million dollars. With evolution of any kind, the salmon can no longer find his way home. He loses his way and he dies. I contend this also leads to disrespect and arrogance. If we came from apes, as we've been told, well, I'm better than apes. Let's go to the local zoo. I can see that I'm better than them. Those dumb apes. I'm better than my forefathers too. Might as well have been apes. I'm better than my parents. The 20th and 21st centuries are full of arrogance where many think they are smarter than all that came before them. How dumb they were back then. They didn't know anything. You hear it all the time. We only just now figure things out. We've been told that so many times. It's in every book, it seems, of modern times. Not a few in the church today foolishly claim God intervened to make the offspring of apes suddenly become human. This is a so-called theistic evolution and a theory that no one in the world really takes seriously except those conservative Catholic crowd, that conservative Catholic crowd trying to save the appearances and dialogue with the revolutionaries. But this too leads to the same problems. Our origins become obscure, making it easy to disregard them who came before us. Those established over us, we reduce everything down to what? Just me and God. He had to intervene all the way. It doesn't really matter. We came from all this blob of matter. It's just me and God, what it comes down to. And we end up disrespecting those in between. Once this path is accepted, it opens the door to disrespecting our parents, our priests who cooperate with God to bring us into existence and our souls into a state of grace at the baptismal font. Or even the Pope who gives our confessors power to absolve our sins and anoint us when in danger of death. It seems to me we're seeing these effects more and more in how many people today speak down to those in authority 
For example, the Pope must resign or attacking some bishop with great disrespect, even if he personally deserved it. We still have to remember our origins and fulfill our nature and respect and honor them and deal with it appropriately. In a word, forgetfulness or obscuring of origins caused at least in part by evolution leads to arrogance and spiritual death. We lose our way, biting the hands that feed us. God, however, the only witness of creation, tells us of our origins and that they're humans, they're Adam and Eve, that he made himself directly. That's what it says in the first chapters of the book of Genesis. Their names we know. They're defined. It's clear. It's been told to us by someone who was there. Their names are Adam and Eve. He made them directly, one from the slime of the earth and the other from the side of man. God works in a definitive way, in a clear way. God also tells us of our origins and in the great originals whom they owe their existence to, Jesus and Mary. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways before he made anything from the beginning. So in other words, God works in a clear and decisive manner, not in an evolutionary manner. Now, there's many lessons, and I want to draw a few out for you today. More lessons than I can probably draw out in a short time, but I'm going to give you a few. Number one, origins matter, don't they? They are important. God placed the desire to know them in our nature. Thus, he will make them clearly known and able to be honored. This, by the way, is one of the reasons why the church condemns what's called in vitro fertilization and demands that marriages remain indissoluble. These, this is among the reasons why. Because children have a right and a need to know who their parents are without any doubt or confusion. And they have a right to have access to them. God does not give us the haziness, obscurity, and confusion that evolution offers. See then the fake science of evolution for what it is, false and dangerous to our faith and to good morals. It attacks us at a very deep levels and is causing much harm to the world. Let us reject it and honor our parents, our ancestors, and spiritual parents always. Number two, I have noticed that oftentimes the very ones, the bloggers, the media stars... Attacking those in authority, attacking parents, priests, bishops, cardinals, and popes have had origin problems. If you look into their lives, they're broken. Broken families, missing parents, abuse. They went off the rails. They have not been able to honor their origins properly, I would hold. They haven't solved this problem according to their nature, what it demands. And I found a new outlet to relieve the pressure. Acting in a sort of evolutionary and revolutionary manner. Namely, using the mass media to apply pressure to force a change. A change they're unable to work out in their own life. And they're now crusaders and saviors of the church. Seems these self-appointed media pundits or saviors have given up on their efforts to return to the home waters. Watch out for them. If your piety is being attacked, hit the click button. Stop reading. Listen to your piety. It's there. It's protecting you from harm. I have never been so offended in my piety recently of some of the things I've seen that's going on in the church. It's horrible. This is a shameful moment. Shameful moment. People are acting. They're adding problem onto problem rather than working with God to solve it. That brings us to another lesson. True Christians have long been known for doing the opposite of what the world does or expects. Thus, we are to love the unlovable. This is the role of a Christian to respect those who personally do not deserve any respect. 
to honor our superiors and those in authority, even as they put us to death. Study the martyrs. They respected almost everybody that put them to death. We bless those who curse us. We embrace suffering willingly. We do the opposite almost every time of what the world is saying to do. We don't form a consensus democratically using the media to force someone to do what we think is right. This is not Christian. Number four, the sacred scriptures speak of how the angels serve his majesty. Thousands upon thousands. Why? Because they found and honored their origin. Let us do the same. Serve those from whom we spring with honor and respect and thanksgiving. And God will bless us. He will help us find our way home surely. He will help us find our way back to the home waters of heaven and the wellspring of all life and love, even unto eternity. And he will do it so that we have a great crown waiting for us when we arrive. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Blessed is he that shall not be scandalized in me. Words taken from today's Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. There have been at least five groups, five groups throughout history that have sought to either ban Christmas or even criminalize its celebration. Not surprisingly, the first group were Protestant revolutionaries, in particular the heretical Puritans. As one journalist of note stated, quote, Puritanism is the haunting fear that somewhere somebody is happy. Well, Christmas was far too joyous and far too wondrous a feast that would cause far too much happiness. And so it could not be allowed in Puritan Boston, for example. In fact, the Puritans made it a day of fasting and penance in reparation for the celebration of this popish and supposedly pagan feast. And furthermore, it was the Plymouth Pilgrims who put their loathing for Christmas Day into practice in 1620 when they spent their first December 25th in the New World working and building various structures, demonstrating their complete contempt for this holy day. The second group seeking to suppress the celebration of Christ's holy birth were the French revolutionaries. The cult or the worship of faulty human reason replaced the worship of the word made flesh. And yes, only in revolutionary France, three king's cakes were renamed egalitarian cakes. The Bolshevik revolutionaries were the next enemies of Christmas, for the religion of atheistic communism and the birth of God become man could not coexist. In the Soviet Union in the 1920s, the League of Militant Atheists encouraged school children to campaign against Christmas traditions, such as the Christmas tree, and they even encouraged them to spit upon crucifixes as a protest against this holiday. Yet another leftist ideology, namely Nazism, proved a foe of Christmas as well. Nazi ideologues saw Christianity as an enemy of the totalitarian state. And as a result, Nazi propagandists sought to de-emphasize or eliminate altogether the Christian aspects of the holiday by promoting numerous Nazified Christmas songs, which replaced Christian lyrics with themes of the regime's racial and socialist ideologies. But the final enemy of Christmas, and all enemies of Christmas are leftists, the final enemy of Christmas were and are progressive ideologues, and they are still very active and powerful in their influence today. The media has tended to dismiss what many are calling a war on Christmas over the last few decades, but Know that the war is real, and it is ultimately a sign of the war on Christianity itself, a war against Christ and his mystical body, which is only the Roman Catholic Church. Perhaps the war began with the near-complete 
commercialization of Christmas, where toy departments became the new Bethlehem and wrapped presents replaced the divine infant wrapped in swaddling clothes. But as time has passed, the war seems more obvious, seems more coordinated. Season's greetings, replacing Merry Christmas as a way to welcome people into stores. Various Christmas carols, Christmas plays, and Christmas concerts began to be canceled or were renamed winter festival events. Christmas trees became holiday trees in some parts of corporate America. And candy canes, to this very day, were no longer given out in some public schools because of their Christian symbolism. For the cane shape of the candy cane is actually the letter J for Jesus. In one particular state, public school choirs were forbidden from singing Christmas carols at Catholic locations thanks to a suit brought by the Freedom From Religion Foundation. In more than a few schools, the annual living nativity scenes were removed from various Christmas pageants due to the potential offense it might cause to some undefined group. Another school district canceled the long-running fifth-grade production of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol because of the complaint of one parent. And even, believe it or not, Charles Schultz's Peanuts character, Linus, is not safe in this war. A Texas school district voted to keep a controversial, a Charlie Brown Christmas religious decoration taken down. In a 6-1 to vote, a particular school board of trustees for an independent school district in the Lone Star State upheld a decision by a middle school principal who ordered the removal of a door decoration of a Peanuts character, Linus, who was reciting to shepherds a verse from the Gospel of Luke. And overseas, the war against Christmas rages on as well. In particular, in Britain, in the United Kingdom, a controversy arose with a temporary promotion of the phrase Winterval for the whole season events, including Christmas festivities, by the Birmingham City Council. People chalk this up to political correctness gone mad, and they laugh perhaps a bit at the ridiculousness of it. But it is ultimately part of a war that is coordinated, not just against Christmas, but again, Christ himself, the very reason for the season. And in this war against Christmas, you will find various competitors that seek to take away attention from the birth of the divine infant. The present season of Hanukkah, for example, was an artificially upgraded to a major feast for Jews in our country as a way to counteract the effects of Christmas on Jewish children. Though a largely forgotten feast taken from a book in the Old Testament which Orthodox Jews do not accept as kosher, Hanukkah was popularized in the 19th century by two rabbis from Cincinnati, Ohio, again to downplay the appeal of Christmas amongst the children of the synagogue. And then there is the truly ridiculous secular feast of Kwanzaa, invented by some Marxist professor of African-American studies who was a convict to boot. Again, we see the creation of an artificial feast meant to compete with the focus on the nativity of Christ. But the war is now being joined in a far more open way by the commander-in-chief of the forces of darkness. You see, with the vacuum created of sorts, created by a war on Christ and a war on Christmas, a war on the divine infant in the manger, the devil will now have his own nativity scene. Or should I say, snake tivity scene. In the Illinois state capital rotunda, there is now a satanic display for the holiday season with a so called snake tivity set entitled, quote, Knowledge Gnosis is the greatest gift of all, which features a woman's hand holding an apple with a snake surrounding it. The designer of this demonic piece of art stated that the forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is actually a gift to mankind. The designer added that, quote, a manger has got nothing on this structure, unquote. Yes, the war on Christmas is ultimately a war on Christ and Christianity. 
For the devil would have us receive the forbidden fruit of knowing sin, of experiencing sin, as opposed to receiving the fruit of the virgin's womb. But why is this unrelenting war against Christmas, against Christianity? Because the devil knows that Christ and his Catholic Church are the one and only existential threat to his demonic kingdom. The devil cares little or nothing about Islam, for that religion is his. He authored the Quran. The devil cares little or nothing for Judaism, for the veil of darkness still covers the eyes of the members of the synagogue. And yes, the devil cares little or nothing for Protestant revolutionaries, for he personally inspired and influenced Luther, Calvin, and Zwingli to create that monstrous distortion of Christ's revelation that cannot bring anyone to heaven. In other words, Satan objectively has these groups as they march unwittingly behind his demonic banner. The devil knows that Christ and his Catholic Church alone are the enemy, and therefore he incessantly wages war against them alone. The devil may not have faith, he may not have true wisdom, but he does know something. He knows what Christ's mission was about, about Christ's advent, why he came. Christ's coming is for the purpose of conquering. He came as a conqueror to conquer the prince of this world first and foremost. It is for the purpose of mounting a counter-revolution against the original revolutionary. In the book of Wisdom, the Bible is very clear. The following prophecy is made about our dearest Lord. Book of Wisdom reads the following, quote, For while all things were in quiet silence, and half spent was the night, midnight, thy almighty word leapt down from heaven, from thy royal throne, as a fierce conqueror into the midst of the land of destruction, unquote. Christianity is resented, and war is mounted against Christmas because Christ and his church militant have declared war on them, on sin, death, the devil, and the spirit of the world. Christianity, therefore, is intolerable, largely because Christ will not tolerate a rival in the throne of our hearts. Christianity is not tolerable because, in a sense, Christ is intolerable, not tolerant. Christ and his Catholic Church make exclusive claims to bringing truth and salvation to men. For outside of Christ and his mystical body, no one can be perfected or saved. The spirit of the world would wish a virtual pantheon of gods where all ways can lead to enlightenment, but Christ and his spiritual army claim a complete monopoly. For our Lord clearly said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and absolutely no one comes to heaven and the Father except through me. Although the war on Christmas, the war on Christianity in this modern world is painful to endure, it is a sure sign for all of us that Catholicism is the one true faith, and the devil hates it, and it's obvious. Leftist ideologues disparage our old heroes and our country. They tear down our special monuments. And yes, they seek most of all to purge Christianity from our land, including a war on Christmas itself. We must realize that our enemies are at root anti-Christian and they're anti-American. This is a battle for the soul, for the soul of our nation, and there is no surrender allowed and no compromise because we literally are at war, a spiritual war. Either we will have the divine infant or the serpent, either the bread of life or the forbidden fruit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways. Before he made anything from the beginning, I was set up from eternity. He that shall find me shall find life and shall have salvation from the Lord. Words taken from the lesson for the Immaculate Conception. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. At Lourdes in 1858, 
Our Lady requested of St. Bernadette to visit the grotto for 15 days in a row. After completing them, the beautiful lady stayed away. She kept silence. She kept her distance for three long weeks. Bernadette also stayed away, not being moved by grace to make a visit to this treasured location. She loved the grotto, but she didn't go. This behavior alone speaks of virtue. It indicates the apparitions were not from man, but from heaven. But then on March 25th, the Feast of the Annunciation, Bernadette was moved by heaven to make her way to the grotto once again. Arriving early in the morning, she found the beautiful lady already in the niche, looking down upon the crowd with kindness and motherly concern. You can just imagine she was longing to have all their prayers answered. That's our mother. During this visit, though, Bernadette felt compelled once again to ask the beautiful lady her name. To reveal her name. She'd already been asked a number of times and she just responded with a smile every time. This time, Bernadette asked three times until the most lovely and grace-filled lady made a sweeping motion with her arms in her hands, looking up to heaven and then down again, not unlike what the priest does at the beginning of the canon of the Mass. At this moment, she declared solemnly, I am the Immaculate Conception. Then smiling, she disappeared. Ah, blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. This declaration, this definition of Our Lady as the immaculate conception is remarkable for many reasons. Among them is the confirmation of papal declaration of immaculate conception defined by Pope Pius IX a few years earlier in 1854. Listen to Pope Pius XI speak about this. He says, what the sovereign pontiff defined in Rome through his infallible magisterium, the immaculate virgin, mother of God, blessed among all women, wanted to confirm with her own words, it would seem, when shortly afterwards she manifested herself by a famous apparition at the grotto of Masabiel. Thank you, Pius XI. In other words, we had heavenly approval of the papacy, of the definition, and of infallibility all in one. Our Lady will watch out for the papacy. What is more, this declaration of our heavenly queen puts an end to any speculations about the so-called theory of theistic evolution, or any evolution at all, but theistic evolution particularly should be put to rest. Anytime someone comes to you that's a Catholic and says they believe in evolution, what is called theistic evolution, talk to them about this. You can't get around it. It's over with. Let's see what I'm talking about. A year after Lourdes in 1859, Charles Darwin published his Origin of Species. And the doctrine, if proposed, the doctrine that this book proposed, wormed its way into almost everything that we do and know. In other words, it's wormed its way into all the sciences, including it's wormed its way into the faith, into our holy Catholic Church. Theistic evolution or evolutionary creation, as sometimes called, is a concept that asserts that classical religious teachings about God are compatible with the modern pseudo, in other words, fake science of evolution, about biological evolution. In short, theistic evolutionists believe that there is a God. They believe all that the church has said in her doctrines, that he is the creator of the universe and by consequence, all life within the universe. And that biological evolution is simply a natural process within that creation. Evolution, according to this view, is simply a tool that God employed to develop the cosmos, including human life. 
So theistic evolution holds that humans evolved from lower species, even single-celled species, but with the intervention of God along the way. Okay, so God used evolution as it went along. Sadly, this fake science is held by many in the church today. People like me get attacked for being against it. But it's so obviously wrong. How can I say that? There's many things erroneous about it at a very high level of philosophy and just plain, simple physics. But there's also this reason. According to the theistic evolutionists, when apes finally appeared on the scene, after who knows how many millions and billions of years, they don't know, no one knows, because it doesn't exist. But that's what they like to say. Adam was conceived, finally. Adam came along in the womb of an ape and elevated by God, by divine intervention, to become a human. Can you imagine the surprise of those apes? <laughs> but let's just stop right here. Wait a minute. Does this mean that an ape is in the line of David? Adam came from the seed of an ape. And from Adam came the entire human race, including the Blessed Virgin Mary, from whom Christ took his flesh. Well, where did Adam get his flesh? From an ape. Does this sound right to you? No, none of us like it. Does this mean when Adam was born, he was just a little human baby? Who then acted as the father of the father of the human race? Who taught him to walk? Who taught him to speak? Did he really suckle at the breast of an ape? Does this sound right? Does it make you feel good and wholesome? No, all of us are going to go and, ugh, that not make any sense. That's your face speaking, by the way. But we're speaking of the father of the human race here. And it sounds like more miracles are required for this theory to be true than God making Adam from the slime of the earth. It's more miracles are required. It's ridiculous. But that's still not the point. Because there's something very powerful here in the Immaculate Conception that utterly destroys theistic evolution. And it's this. If Adam were conceived in the womb of an ape, then he too would have been immaculately conceived. He's just a little baby. He hasn't committed the original sin yet. Thus, he must have been conceived immaculately. Now, wait a minute. Something's wrong. This doesn't work on the level of faith. It doesn't work. Why? Because Our Lady said, I am the Immaculate Conception, not one of many, not one of three. I am the Immaculate Conception. Okay, that's an apparition. Let's, let's add on to that a little bit. Is she telling the truth, we can ask? Well, let's turn to Pope Pius IX and his declaration of the Immaculate Conception. He taught this. The church has made it clear and indeed that the conception of Mary is to be venerated as something extraordinary wonderful, eminently holy, and here's the good part, and different from the conception of all other human beings. No exceptions. Different from the conception of all other human beings. Adam could not have been conceived, therefore, in the womb of an ape, for he would have been immaculately conceived. And there's only one immaculate conception. Either the church and her perfect type, the lady, is wrong, or evolution is an erroneous doctrine. Take your pick. Are we going to follow the infallible, ordinary, and extraordinary magistrate of the church? Or are we going to give in to this pseudo-fake science? Come on. It's obvious. It doesn't work. And we should propose this to anybody who's a theistic evolutionist and says, oh, you can be Catholic and you can have evolution. Oh, so that's so. Have you studied the Immaculate Conception? Blessed be her holy and Immaculate Conception. Once again, it comes to our aid and crushes an error. 
Now, for Bernadette, this saying of Our Lady had a twofold significance, as time would prove. And these were her last words, it turns out, to the little visionary. Even though she would appear two more times, she didn't say anything else. This fact alone indicates that these words are important. They're meaningful. But second of all, these words also broke down the adversity of the clergy. Now, at Lourdes, the clergy, acting correctly, rightly resisted Bernadette to see if what she was doing came from heaven or from hell. The clergy had a deep responsibility to lead the sheep and guide them safely. And that requires much prudence and discernment of spirits. So one of St. Vincent de Paul's preferred methods of discerning was simply just to say no to everything. People were always proposing things to me, say, no, go away. And he would say no until heaven made it plain that it was God's will. And then he'd say, okay, I'll do it. And look at all the things he did. But he was always saying, no, get away, get away. Prove it to me that it's from heaven, because I'm not going to do it unless I know it's from God. St. John of the Cross describes similar things in his ascent of Mount Carmel. So the Dean of Lords wanted to be sure. He wanted sure and reliable proofs that heaven was speaking. And among them, he asked for the name of the lady. In the meantime, they would remain aloof, silent about the happenings at the grotto. And nothing worked to break this silence, as did the exclamation of Our Lady, I am the Immaculate Conception. Soon the Dean of Lords took to defending Bernadette against all attackers. And he built a chapel at the grotto so that the Son of Man might descend upon the altar and take up his abode in the tabernacle. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. For us, among other things, we can take the three weeks of silence as a type, an image of the Old Testament that is only ended with the angel coming down from heaven to blessed Mary and announcing the Savior. The long-awaited Messiah has come. The silence was broken. God was going to speak his word in the flesh. But what broke the silence? The presence of the Immaculate Conception upon the earth. That's what broke the silence. Soon the church was made visible to the whole world to enter. Thanks to her presence again. Blessed be her holy and Immaculate Conception. So here then is our lesson today. The Immaculate Conception breaks the silence or the delay of heaven. The Immaculate Conception can end the wrath of God. She opens the bridge between heaven and earth. And it seems to me that this is very important at this time. Let us not lose hope at the silence of heaven in our day. I think some are. Some wonder when it's going to get over with. What's going to happen? Trust. Heaven will not be silent forever. The Immaculate Conception is here. She will work. Because this very same Immaculate Conception is watching over us as she was on that day when Bernadette arrived early. She hears our pleas and will soon speak somehow to convert the clergy at the highest levels to do her bidding. In other words, The bidding she made clear, abundantly clear at Fatima. So that the world will have the one true church as its chapel. And there will be processions. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Now for us personally to experience the same effects, we ought to be praying three Hail Marys in the morning and three Hail Marys at night. We get out of bed. And before we go to bed, we should be saying three Hail Marys. But we should say it with this invocation. It's approved by the church and indulged. By thine immaculate conception, O Mary, make my body pure and my soul holy. I'll put it in the bulletin this coming Sunday. By thine immaculate conception, O Mary, make my body pure and my soul holy. Hail Mary, full of grace. Three times. She will help us silence the foe and the evil of sin. Now, turning to the Via Negativa, we can make one or two more points on the same idea. In other words, the Immaculate Conception silences doubt, as we just explained with the 
with uh, theistic evolution. Nay, even it silences temptation, blasphemy, and atheism. She quells revolution. Pope Pius IX explained how the Immaculate Conception will deliver us from threatening dangers. Through her, errors will be dissipated. And she will remove spiritual blindness from those who are in error. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Be sure to present the immaculate conception to any of your theistic evolutionary friends. It cannot, they will not get around it because you can't get around it. At Lourdes, on the second of the 15 days of visits, St. Bernadette experienced this personally. During her rapture before the beautiful lady, a mob of devils working from the river Gav tried to interfere with things. And they came alive and they, there's this cacophony of voices. And one big guttural voice spoke out the loudest, get out of here, yelling at her, get out, trying to scare her. A mere glance, however, from the immaculate conception positioned in the niche above rendered the demons silent. She sent them packing back to hell. Again, we have something if we're struggling with. You want to conquer it? Pray by thine immaculate conception, O Mary, make my body pure and my soul holy. Hail Mary. And now I'll end with a final example. The atheistic, anti-clerical, 19th century Jewish man, Alphonse Radisbone, was challenged by a friend, a baron, to wear a miraculous medal while visiting Rome. If you're so tough, if you're so, you know, sure of yourself, come on, wear this medal, I dare you. And he wore it. It was a challenge. When touring a small church waiting for his friend, the baron, Alphonse suddenly had a vision of the Immaculate Virgin Mary. He fell on his knees. And upon coming out of this rapture, he later wrote, I seized the medal which was on my breast. I fervently kissed the image of the Virgin. Oh, it had indeed been she. I was not able to speak. I did not wish to discuss what had happened. I felt within me something so solemn and so sacred as to require me to speak, ask for a priest. His anti-clericalism was over. I want to see a priest. Alphonse continued to kiss his miraculous medal, which was wet with tears. He begged his friend, the baron, to take him immediately to a priest, saying he did not know how he could continue to live without baptism. This is the same day. He now saw clearly why he had come to Rome and how very wrong he had been heretofore. The baron took him to the church of Santa Maria Maggiore and then to St. Peter's to give thanks to God. The baron recounted, he not only believed in the real presence, he felt its reality. When he was approaching the altar of reservation, he seemed quite overcome and as though he ought at once to withdraw. For it seemed to him a horrible thing to come before the living God in a state of original sin. He went immediately to take refuge in the chapel of Our Lady, saying, Here at least I am not fearful, for I know myself to be under the protection of boundless mercy. Radisbon declared, It was she herself that I beheld in reality. I saw her just as I see you now. But his eyes were unable to bear the brightness of the heavenly light when he did have the vision. Three times he tried to look at her, her face, and each time he was unable to raise his eyes beyond her hands. From there poured out rays of light, just as is seen on the metal. Torrents of grace in the appearance of rays of light. Alphonse received baptism within a week. He was immediately reconciled to his brother who preceded him in the Catholic faith and later joined him to become a priest ever seeking the conversion of the Jewish people. Among the converts of those two priests, brothers, were a total of 28 members of their family. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. The immaculate conception puts an end to silence. 
an end to wrath, an end to doubts, an end to delay of heavenly intervention, an end to blasphemy, heresy, error, fake science, atheism, and as we saw with Alphonse Radisbon, an end to anti-clericalism. How well Pope Pius IX spoke in saying, the Immaculate Conception will deliver us from threatening dangers. Through her errors will be dissipated, and she will remove spiritual blindness from those who are in error. And as we heard in the lesson, he that shall find me shall find life and shall have salvation from the Lord. O oh, Immaculate Mary, conceived without original sin, Pray for us who have recourse to thee. Immaculate heart of Mary, be our salvation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Words taken from today's Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I have a great devotion to St. Francis of Assisi, and of course, for many of you, you might know that the Franciscans are the great defenders of the mystery of the Immaculate Conception of our Blessed Mother. But near the cell of the great St. Francis of Assisi, a locust, a bug, had set up a home on a fig tree. One day, St. Francis lovingly called out to the bug to come near. It came immediately and sat upon his hand. St. Francis then said to the bug, Sing, my sister locust, and praise the Lord with jubilation who has created you. Obediently, the bug began to sing, and it continued as long as the saint joined his song with its. And then, after a duet of sorts, St. Francis told the locust to return to its home. Gratitude to the Most High God Thanksgiving to the God who saves us. This was the constant theme of the life of St. Francis. There was also the time that St. Francis preached a powerful sermon to a flock of birds. My sister birds, he once said, you owe God very much gratitude. And you ought always and everywhere to praise and to exalt him. St. Francis then went on to give the birds reasons for gratitude. You can fly. You have beautiful feathers. You sow not, and neither do you reap. And yet the good Lord gives you and feeds you and gives you rivers and springs to drink from. And finally, he gives you trees to build your nests in. St. Francis then warned the birds, Watch therefore well, my sister birds, that you are not ungrateful, but you busy yourselves always in praising the good Lord. But this powerful sermon, after this powerful sermon to the birds, all those little birds began to open their beaks. They began to beat their wings and to stretch out their necks. And then an act of thanksgiving and adoration, the birds bowed their heads reverently to the earth. But the greatest song of thanksgiving ever sung, the greatest hymn of gratitude, was that of our Blessed Mother. Her Magnificat, nothing greater in terms of human lips, pronouncing words of praise. Her Magnificat, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. It's a hymn of such appreciation for the Almighty who has done such great things for her. One saintly nun, one consecrated religious, pondered the mystery of the visitation. You know the mystery when our Dearest Blessed Mother visited her kinswoman, Elizabeth, but also the mystery where Jesus visited St. John the Baptist, both of them being in the womb. This one saintly nun pondered the mystery of the visitation when Christ Jesus resided in the womb of Mary, his mother. The nun wrote the following, quote, Jesus is still in the womb of his mother, and he cannot yet express with his lips what is hidden in his soul. And so he whispers it to his holy mother, and it passes through her heart and her virginal lips. And then Mary sings her blessings, and she, first of all, begins the songs 
of thanksgiving, unquote. Today in the Holy Liturgy, remember the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary, a mystery of grace that preserved her from any stain of original sin, a mystery of grace in which she was conceived in the womb of her mother, St. Anne, sinlessly. And Mary does not fail to give thanks for this singular grace, this singular privilege, this singular mercy. Now, proofs regarding this dogmatic belief can be found throughout Holy Scripture. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, very famous verse. It's sometimes called the Proto-Evangelium, the first hints of the gospel, the first seed of the gospel. And it states clearly that God will establish enmity, an enemy relationship between the woman to come and the serpent, between Mary and Satan. But if Mary were conceived in original sin, then there would not be a relationship of enmity present. For if she were without grace, she would be in Satan's camp. No, it would not be right that she who was to crush and conquer Satan would first be crushed by him. A prophecy pointing to Our Lady in the Song of Songs states the following about the fair bride of the divine bridegroom. You are all beautiful, my love, tota pulcra. You are all beautiful, my love, and there is no blemish in you, the scriptures state. And certainly we can cite today's gospel, St. Luke's Holy Gospel, where Mary is spoken of as being gratia plena, full of grace. True fullness of grace would be lacking if she came into this world with sin. The fathers of the church, those great teachers of the early centuries, affirm the tradition of the Immaculate Conception. One church father writes, quote, He who formed the first virgin, Eve, without deformity, also made the second Eve without spot or stain. Another writes, Mary was not infected by the venomous breath of the serpent. And in a beautiful hymn by that holy deacon, St. Ephraim, who is sometimes called the harp of the Holy Ghost. St. Ephraim writes, quote, You alone, O Jesus, and your mother are more beautiful than any others, for there is no blemish in you, nor any stains upon your mother, unquote. And the saints, too, would call her the highest honor of our race. They would call her the lily among thorns, they would refer to her as an offshoot of grace, not of wrath. She has fallen mankind's singular boast. She's the never-fading wood that the worm of sin never corrupted. But perhaps the most powerful proofs of the Immaculate Conception of Mary are based upon simple common sense. Archbishop Fulton Sheen put it best. He pointed to the fact that if one could make his own mother... Wouldn't he make her perfect? Wouldn't he love her so much that he would protect her from any harm, from any fall, from any blemish? I mean, if you could make your own mother. Well, the Son of God did literally create his own mother. And he made her perfect. And of course, the common sense argument used by the great Franciscan, blessed John Duns Scotus, a member of that Franciscan family, which are the greatest defenders of Our Lady's singular privilege. Scotus stated, Potuit decuit ergo vecit. Roughly translated, God could do it, conceive and bring about Mary without sin. God should do it, it's proper and good, and therefore he did do it. Our Lady was preserved, preserved from any stain, of original sin. She was saved in an extraordinary way. Whereas we are picked up after having fallen and cleansed, Mary was prevented from falling and thus was stainless. She was held back from falling. Mary gives thanks all the more because she is more indebted to the Savior than we actually are. She owes him more because she's been given more. 
And all of this led to that event that occurred 164 years ago today, where blessed Pius IX, surrounded by the spiritual sons of St. Francis of Assisi, exercised the charism of infallibility in an extraordinary way, proclaiming as the successor of St. Peter the following words, quote, We define that the doctrine which holds that the Blessed Virgin Mary, at the first instant of her conception, by a singular privilege and grace of the omnipotent God, in consideration of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Savior of all mankind, was preserved free from all stain of original sin, unquote. Jesus is present as we enter towards the altar for the sacrifice of the Mass. Jesus is present in the most blessed of all sacraments. He's at our altars because the Word has become flesh. Daily, we have an annunciation at our altars. Daily, we have a visitation at our altars. And daily, we have the representing of Calvary on our altars. We have a daily Bethlehem here on our altars. But despite that our Lord is present in flesh, in blood, in soul, and divinity, there is still a hiddenness. He is little because he's had an infinite condescension in that sacred host. And as a result, he cannot express himself. And so he whispers words of praise and thanksgiving into the hearts of those who adore him in the blessed sacrament. And in turn, they are to raise their lips as they continue to sing that song of thanksgiving, which was begun by our blessed mother. Our souls proclaim the greatness of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, There shall be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations. Words taken from today's Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the Old Testament, in the first book of Kings, to be exact, the good Lord grants Israel its first king, namely King Saul, who was of the tribe of Benjamin. King Saul is very tall. He's a strong figure who becomes filled, the Bible tells us, with the Spirit of God after being anointed by the prophet Samuel. But King Saul has a penchant for disobeying direct orders of the good Lord. And as a result of his sin, Saul is rejected by the king, or rejected as king, I should say, by the good Lord. And David, the son of Jesse, a man after the heart of God, is chosen in his place. Yet despite being the chosen one to lead God's people, David will not usurp the throne. He will not revolt against King Saul. David, rather, will wait for the good Lord to remove Saul, who was anointed and appointed as king. David, the Bible is clear, is very handsome, and he's a charismatic personality. David is also filled with great courage and gains the allegiance of the people, especially with his killing off of Goliath, the giant Philistine and sworn enemy of the Hebrews. King Saul is filled with jealousy. He's filled with rage against David, and he seeks any number of ways to kill David. Twice, the Bible says, he seeks to pierce David through with a spear. King Saul also offers his daughter in marriage to David, but only at a cost of killing many Philistines and endangering his own life in the process. King Saul is truly possessed. The Bible is clear. King Saul is possessed by a demonic spirit and even consults a witch to gain insight. But despite all these attacks, all these dangers, David remains on the defensive. He protects himself, of course, but David never seeks to kill King Saul. Gathering a faithful army of men about him, David becomes a fugitive on the run from King Saul. 
And on two occasions, two occasions, mind you, David has an easy opportunity to kill Saul. Once as the king was relieving himself in a cave, at another time when David and a few companions find themselves before a sleeping King Saul in his royal tent. But David refuses to lift the sword against King Saul. No one but the good Lord is to take out the one that the good Lord has anointed. David will wait until the Lord removes Saul from the scene. David will not ascend the throne until the time has come, according to the workings of divine providence. Saul was still David's king, no matter how wicked and evil Saul was. And this title of king rendered the person of Saul inviolable. David did not usurp the throne. He did not demand Saul's resignation or abdication. He did not question Saul's legitimacy to act as a king. He did not participate in a revolution against the Lord's anointed, though Saul had fallen from grace. Though all of his hot-headed advisors suggested otherwise, David would act on the defensive and not be the aggressor. For he embraced the mysterious plans of divine providence and what God will allow. The good God had promised David the throne, but had not authorized him to lay violent hands upon Saul. As a result of this, the great church father and church doctor, St. John Chrysostom, stated that David gained more merit in sparing Saul than in killing Goliath, the Philistine. David would officially become king only after Saul had died in battle, literally falling upon his own sword as opposed to be taken by the enemy army. Now, on February 11th, 2013, Pope Benedict XVI announced his abdication from the throne of St. Peter. At the end of that month, Benedict would no longer act as Bishop of Rome and the visible head of the mystical body of Christ on earth. This unprecedented move, simply retiring from office due to age or weakness, certainly has severely damaged the papacy. On March 13, 2013, at 7.13 p.m., lots of 13s, white smoke arose from the chimney of the Sistine Chapel announcing the election of a new pontiff. Habemus Papam, we have a pope. Initially, I did not know the identity of the new pontiff, but I soon found out that he was a Jesuit, and a Jesuit from South America. To be honest with you, I was not very confident about the new papacy. Very concerned, in fact, from day one. Furthermore, when he appeared on the balcony without the mozetta, without the traditional velvet shoulder-length cape, I was concerned that his rejection of time-honored customs might suggest that this new pope had certainly a disdain for tradition. People spoke of his Marian piety, trusting that perhaps Our Lady would temper the new Pope's revolutionary tendencies. One thing was for sure, though, we had a new Pope, period. No voting cardinal, not even the canon law expert and former prefect of the Vatican's highest court, Cardinal Burke, ever questioned the legitimacy of Benedict's resignation or the legitimacy of Francis' election. And this is the case still to this day. No voting cardinal has ever clamored for Francis' resignation. Like David, Cardinal Burke sees with the eyes of faith. He embraces the mysterious workings of divine providence. He's defending the faith, of course, Cardinal Burke, but never being aggressively agitating or being revolutionary. His voice is not like that of Abishai in the Bible, one of David's hot-headed lieutenants. What David stated so long ago applies here. But David said to Abishai, do not kill Saul, for who can lift a hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless, unquote. 
But despite the example of Cardinal Burke and the obvious legitimacy of papacy of Pope Francis, various abishais have arisen, hot-headed, unthinking, and revolutionary in their mindset. They aggressively attack the legitimacy of Pope Francis, like untrained pundits foolishly pontificating on matters that are well beyond their pay grade and certainly mysterious. They draw dogmatic conclusions with an arrogant air of pseudo-infallibility. And sad to say, even a bishop has fallen prey to this insanity, albeit a retired bishop. Stating his unfiltered, unthoughtful, imprudent, and revolutionary position on the matter of the pontificate of Francis on an internet blog website, the former bishop of Corpus Christi, Texas, concluded writing, quote, I call for a meeting of 12 valid cardinals to declare the papacy of Francis the merciful invalid, as well as declaring invalid the status of the title cardinal on all the men he tried to elevate to the College of Cardinals, unquote. The Abishai spirit is strong in him as he seeks to do away with the anointed one of God, referring to Bergoglio, as he calls him, as an anti-pope. These imprudent statements made by both clergy and laity, their insulting language, their demands for resignation, have had a bad effect. A recent poll was done on a conservative Catholic website regarding the identity of the present pope. Who's pope? Of the hundreds and hundreds of respondents to this poll, more than 70% believe that Benedict was still the reigning pontiff. Extraordinary. Holy Mother Church has entered into the Advent season on her calendar and in her liturgy as well. And on this first Sunday of Advent, the end of the world and the second coming of Christ is openly discussed including the upheaval and turmoil that will occur even in the very heavens above. Traditionally speaking, the notion of there being signs of the end of the world in the heavens above, in the sun, in the moon, and the stars, and the planets, and other celestial bodies literally falling from the sky, can also refer to the fall of churchmen, according to the church fathers. That is, heavenly bodies falling downwards also points to various bishops and priests and even bishops of Rome falling from grace and falling away from the faith into heresy and apostasy. We are all aware that as the last days approach, the Catholic faith and the church herself will have seemed to have disappeared. Tradition is clear on this matter. But in these dangerous times, in these uncertain times, in these confusing times, let us not fall prey to deception and to the spirit of the Antichrist. We cannot become chicken littles as the sky falls and as various prelates fall from the heights. Our Lord predicted it all. Our Lord stated that the deceptions of the Antichrist will be so powerful that even the elect the ones chosen by God are susceptible to being fooled by these deceptions and would in fact be fooled if the time of evil were not shortened. And many Catholics, especially conservative and traditional ones, are being fooled daily. What did Pope Benedict XVI actually state in his resignation speech on February 11, 2013? Have we actually read what he said? For his words will not only give us his intention, but also demonstrate the objective act of leaving the throne of St. Peter, leaving it vacant, empty. Benedict stated the following, quote, After having repeatedly examined my conscience, repeatedly examined my conscience, he writes, before God, I have come to the certainty that my strengths, due to an advanced age, are no longer suited to adequately exercise the Petrine ministry. He continues, for this reason, 
and well aware of the seriousness of this act and with full freedom. I declare that I renounce the ministry of the Bishop of Rome in such a way that as from the 28th of February 2013 at 4 o'clock, the See of Rome, the See of St. Peter will be vacant, empty, and a conclave to elect the new Supreme Pontiff will be convoked by those whose competence it is, unquote. Full freedom, having examined his conscience, he renounces the throne, and the throne is empty. Could anything be more clear than that? Pope Benedict quit. He resigned. He abdicated the throne of Peter, leaving it empty until it could be filled by another pope. And in addition to this clear, clear statement, Benedict has, on several occasions, had to restate his purpose in resigning, the validity of his act. He writes, there isn't the slightest doubt about the validity of my resignation from the Petrine ministry, Benedict stated. The only condition, he states, for the validity is the full freedom of the decision. And then he adds, speculation about its invalidity is simply absurd, unquote. Seeing how clear Benedict was, it is no wonder that a good priest friend of mine stated to his parishioners lately that any notion that Benedict is still Pope is clearly an insane position to take. And furthermore, the notion that there is some sort of divided papacy a daring duo of men in white carrying out a combination of both active and passive aspects of the papacy is also equally insane. There can only be one bishop of Rome. He's a monarch, one ruler. Benedict's confusing statement regarding his still having a share in the Petrine ministry or still being within the enclosure of St. Peter was not to be taken literally but only figuratively, as is clearly indicated by Benedict's carefully worded phrase, quote, so to speak, versus stating openly that he's still Pope. That retired bishop that I mentioned who blogs regularly, blogging, the retired bishop I mentioned earlier fell prey to that error so common today of expanding the charism of papal infallibility to the point of the ridiculous, as if the Pope were impeccable, somehow unable to sin, unable to speak anything against the faith. The bishop erroneously states the following quote, If Bergoglio, as he calls him, seems repeatedly to engage in material error, that first raises the question of the validity of his election because one expects an authentically elected Roman pontiff miraculously and uniformly to be entirely incapable of stating error in regards to faith and morals, unquote. That he somehow protected miraculously from ever speaking any error against the faith. You wonder if this good bishop ever read a church history book in his life. Didn't the case of the very public error of Pope John XXII come to his mind at least? With this statement made by the former Bishop of Corpus Christi, Texas, as a measurement for who is and who is not a Pope, you wonder if we've actually even had a real Pope since Pope St. Pius X. There have been more than a few erroneous statements and scandalous actions over the last 50 years especially. Various conservative Catholics are up in arms against Pope Francis's confusing statements and teachings that are unsound and offensive to pious ears. But where were their voices in previous pontificates? In other words, people would decry Pope Francis's lack of liturgical reverence, not genuflecting at the time of the consecration. But what about the de facto destruction of the Roman rite by Pope Paul VI? I think one was a little bit more serious, wouldn't you? 
Many are up in arms, and rightly so, about Holy Communion being made available in certain cases for the divorced and remarried Catholics still engaged in adulterous acts. For the divorced, receiving communion, yes. Yet one, Father Ratzinger, held the same position as far back as 1972. And today, even though his position evolved on the matter, Benedict would still allow such persons in adulterous unions to act as sponsors for the sacraments or leaders in church communities. And yes, it is true that Pope Francis spoke in a vulgar way on a plain interview regarding a woman who had eight children by cesarean section and made that vulgar statement, we're not like rabbits. But isn't it true that Pope Paul VI of the Mani Vitae spoke about the importance of responsible parenthood seven times mentioned in the document because he had fallen prey to the population or overpopulation myth? It is true that Pope Francis has been infected by ecumenical and interreligious dialogue fever. But has he ever done anything that would approach the horrors of the Assisi Prayer for Peace meetings held three times during the pontificate of Pope John Paul II? This former pope celebrated the fact that he prayed with pagans for the first time in Togo, Africa, as he put it, which objectively speaking was a direct violation of the first commandment of God. In other words, Pope Francis is the full flourishing, the full flourishing of the fruits of the spirit of the council. He's not different in kind than modern popes. He's rather only different in degree. As a final note, more than a few Catholics are falling prey to the revolutionary spirit of Abishai, which leads to various forms of sedificantism, where the Pope is no longer there, there is no Pope, or that Benedict is still Pope. We must embrace the spirit of David, King David, which is a counter-revolutionary spirit that endures this time that endures the cross and embraces the mysteries of divine providence, how much God will allow and permit. Despite the evil King Saul attacking David and hurting the people of Israel daily, David does not aggressively seek to remove the anointed one of the Lord. Rather, David protects himself and waits for the Lord to resolve the problem. We must accept the fact, and this is what people don't want to accept, the obvious fact that Francis is our Holy Father and that we truly deserve him. We truly deserve him. He is the perfect pope for the modern Catholic. The perfect pope. He's the perfect pope for an unfaithful people and he is the surest sign that the good shepherd in heaven above is not pleased with his flock. We have to wake up to that. Therefore, let us make reparation for our crimes and let us beg God for relief. In Advent, we say, come, Lord Jesus, and save us. Come and do not delay. Ransom us, for we are held captive. Look kindly upon us. And though we are very undeserving, come to our aid and remove our present affliction. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Then they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with great power and majesty. But when these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption is at hand. Words taken from the gospel for this first Sunday of Advent. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. They shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with great power and majesty. This cloud is not a physical cloud so much as the cloud of saints. One of the antiphons 
echoing scripture, one of the anaphons for the breviary says, Behold, the Lord shall come and all his saints with him. And there shall be a great light in that day. Oh, to be counted among, among their number. To come back to this earth in the company of the king, its lord and master. In power and majesty and glory. That would be something. It's going to happen. Let's be counted among them. At the beginning of Advent, as the gospel indicates, it is fitting to reflect on the second coming. Advent is about coming. We speak and reflect upon the second coming at the beginning of Advent and then the first coming as we get closer to Christmas. And as we know from the creed that His Majesty, Christ our Lord and King, will indeed come again to judge the living and the dead. We call this the general judgment, which follows the second coming and the resurrection of Of all men, the general resurrection, the resurrection from the dead. From our catechism, we know there are, in fact, two judgments. There's the particular judgment and there is the general judgment. The particular judgment happens immediately upon death with each person being judged according to his deeds and receives his just reward or punishment. This judgment only involves the individual. It is a personal judgment. Judgment. No one else is involved. The general judgment, however, takes place only after everyone gets their bodies back. Furthermore, the whole world, this is the key, the whole world from the beginning unto the very end will be considered together. And this is why it's called general or universal. Man is judged as an individual in the particular judgment but as a member of society in the general judgment, others will be involved. In other words, humanity as a whole and each and every member of humanity will be judged all together, at least in as much as their actions, good or bad, affected the whole. As the Dies Irae, which is the sequence for the Requiem Mass, indicates... It says, wondrous sound the trumpet flingeth, through the earth's sepulchres it ringeth, all before the throne it bringeth. Lo, the book exactly worded, wherein all hath been recorded, thence shall judgment be awarded. When the judge his seat attaineth, and each hidden deed arraigneth, nothing unavenged remaineth. Obviously, this sort of judgment can only take place at the end of the world, when all is completed, when the last page has been written. We also know that the judge will be his majesty, Jesus Christ, as man. This is because the damned, that is the goats, cannot come before his divinity. And also because it is fitting that we be judged by his majesty as man, because that he is the head of the body, the church. He is the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the firstborn of creation and the firstborn from the dead. One who has human nature like us, one who lived among us and died for us. It is fitting that he be the judge. Perhaps one easy way now for us to understand what's going to happen on that day in order for us to grasp this mystery and why it's important. And perhaps an easy way then is to consider the church's traditional process of canonizing saints. This comparison or analogy is fitting because in the end, everyone that is saved is added to the list of the elect, which is what canon really means, list. So in the end, Everyone in the choir of the sheep is canonized. So the canonization process of old prefigures the general judgment in some way. So in times past, it was part of the procedure that before any saintly person could be officially canonized, their good effect upon the world had to be established. To put it another way, the holiness of the individual upon death 
giving us some assurance that they died in the good graces of God was not enough. Okay, that's not enough for canonization. This pertains to the particular judgment. No, their legacy, their legacy had to be examined. Saints make a mark upon the world. Saints make history. They are God's instruments in the world for making his holy will come to pass in time and space, producing effects that endure, producing much good fruit. Producing a legacy, in other words. Saints cast a light upon the world that often shines even down to the end of the ages, to the very last day. We can think of the evangelists and apostles, St. Matthew and St. John. By cooperating with God in this life, they left a legacy, didn't they? They wrote their respective gospels under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Something that will continue to the end of time, affecting millions upon millions upon millions of souls. Many have basked in their light and found peace. Thus we hear in the Apocalypse, which is read at the Daily Mass of the Dead and on All Souls Day. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, for their works follow them. It's not enough just to die in the Lord, but that their works endured too. An example is found in a saint that died on this day in the 16th century, namely St. Francis Xavier of the Society of Jesus. The Roman Martyrology for today says of him that he was the apostle to the Indies, renowned for the conversions he made among the Gentiles. Listen to the words, renowned. His legacy is continuing. It goes on. He's renowned for supernatural gifts and miracles. Who died in the Lord full of merits and good works. There it is. And these merits and good works, his renown is living on to this very day. In India especially. They don't forget St. Francis Xavier. This is obvious the case of solidly established religious orders as well. Like say the Benedictines, the Dominicans or the Carmelites. Their saintly founders are still shining in these orders in various places of the world. Their rule is still making saints. Changing the world for the better. Saints like Teresa of Jesus were even given visions of their order and what it would do down through time. And that it would last to the end of the world. So from this, we can see what we do with ourselves in this world lives on after we die. Either for good or for ill. And how these works we have done affect the rest of the world, the rest of mankind, is why there's a general judgment. This is reflected in the canonization process of old, in that a cause for sainthood could only be considered after the person was dead for at least 50 years. They delayed it. This delay was done not only to prevent false enthusiasm and emotions and political motives from influencing sound reason, but also to see what legacy they actually left. What did they do? If the proposed saints' works and writings caused confusion, this process was discontinued. He's not worthy of the title saint. He may be in heaven. We're not saying he's not. We're just saying you're not going to be considered a canonized saint because you didn't cast a light upon the world. You cast some confusion. If they produce clarity and fruits, then they would continue with the process. I recall how in the beatification of Anna Maria Taigi, she's a 19th century mystic, a wife, a mother, and a mystic, the title of the book says of her. It's very well done. In her beatification process, and she had many miracles, unbelievable. 
But in the beatification process, the devil's advocate noted Anna wore a ribbon in her hair during her early 20s as a sign of vanity. She should not be canonized. That's pretty strict. Obviously, he's grasping. But isn't it interesting that she's not canonized yet? She should be. She now lies very much beautifully incorrupt in the church of San Crisogono in Rome in a crystal coffin. And I melted when I saw her. She is extremely incorrupt, beautiful. But there's delay to see if their following increases and is healthy. There's always the delay of the church to see if their following will actually increase, if their good works will have an effect on the world, or whether they'll decrease and go away. In other words, are these, as it were, sponsored by God? Are these of God? Or are they of man? We need to find out. And it takes at least 50 years to figure that out. You see how the general judgment is reflected in the canonization process? The general judgment could also be compared to God's miracles. They're truly wonderful works, but the important part is they usually are not just for individuals, are they? They are to be living on and helping others. God works miracles to encourage the faithful and to dispose non-believers to believe. True miracles take away doubts. There are not many of these being worked in our times, are there? Don't despair. They will come back. We've been promised. There will be great miracles. In any case, we're being tested right now. And we find additional examples of our need to leave a legacy in the scriptures. One place is 2 Maccabees chapter 6. We find an old man, Eleazar, being forced to eat meat forbidden by the law. But he refuses because of the shadow it would cast upon the world. Listen to the sacred scripture. He has some friends standing by. But they that stood by being moved with wicked pity. Wicked pity. For the old friendship they had with a man, taking him aside, desired that flesh might be brought, which was lawful for him to eat, that he might make as if he had eaten as the king had commanded of the flesh of the sacrifice. But instead he ate safe meat. That's legal. That by so doing he might be delivered from death. And for the sake of their old friendship with the man, they did him this courtesy. But he began to consider the dignity of his age and his ancient years and the inbred honor of his gray head and his good life and conversation from a child. And he answered without delay, according to the ordinances of the holy law made by God, saying that he would rather be sent into the other world. For it doth not become our age, said he, to dissemble. Whereby many young persons might think that Eleazar, at the age of fourscore and ten years, was gone over into the life of the heathens. And so they, through my dissimulation, and for a little time of a corruptible life, should be deceived. And hereby, I should bring a stain and a curse upon my old age. There it is. I should bring a stain and a curse upon my old age. For though for the present time I should be delivered from the punishment of men, yet should I not escape the hand of the Almighty, neither alive nor dead. In other words, there's a general judgment when all will see that I played a little trick and got away. Wherefore, he says, by departing manfully out of this life, I shall show myself worthy of my old age, and I shall leave an example of fortitude to young men, if with a ready mind and constancy. I'm going to leave an example, a heritage, a legacy. And we're still thinking about it today. And the chapter ends thus. Thus did this man die, leaving not only to young men, but also to the whole nation. The memory of his death for an example of virtue and fortitude. Nay, not even the whole nation, the whole world until the end of time. In the sacred liturgy for the feast days of the saints found in the Holy Mass and the Roman breviary, we often hear how the church refers to them, the saints, as cedars of Lebanon. 
Cedar wood lasts a long time. It is a very durable wood and resists corruption. It smells good too. And insects avoid it. The symbolism is clear. They have left a heritage that is to saints and it lasts and it's indestructible. And the devil can't touch it. Finally, we see something of this using the via negativa, that is the negative way, by examining the goats. We do not know much of anything about the damned, nor should we bother. Listen to Venerable Mother Mary of Agreda explain. Never has the Lord shown me the final ruin of any soul, which has damned itself. This knowledge is withheld from me by the providence of God because he is so just that he does not deem it befitting to reveal the damnation of a soul except for some great purpose. Fidyar Dostoevsky in the Brothers Karamazov speaks about how God, so to speak, forgets these souls. That's frightening. Their works will not last. What they did is not worth remembering. All that needs to be shown of their works in the general judgment is that they could not frustrate the plan of God, not even all of them combined through all time. And that's what's going to be shown. The lessons from this doctrine of the general judgment as we discussed it today are clear. First of all, we should long to do something for God and man that lasts like the cedars of Lebanon. Something that casts light and alleviates confusion. This we can do by working with God to fulfill virtuously the duties of our state and life. He will do the rest. My holy founder put it like this. The memory and the examples of a holy religious last as long as the house that he built by his virtues. The more virtuously you built your house, the longer it lasts. The more it's like a cedar of Lebanon. Let us then build a house that lasts. Let's put it another way using the scriptures. Let us become a spectacle to the world. A fool for Christ, as St. Paul says. In order to prevent from becoming a spectacle in the general judgment. St. Paul said, I think that God has set forth us apostles, the last, as it were, men appointed to death. We are made a spectacle to the world and to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake. Thank you, St. Paul. So let's do something for God and man that lasts. Number two, all will be revealed someday, won't it? We should keep this in mind when contemplating our daily duties and works, ever asking if this is God's holy will. But also, we should keep this in mind when we are tempted to hold our neighbor in disdain or contempt. Think about it. What disdain would we deserve if those around us could see us as if the general judgment were now? In seeing our disordered thoughts and sinful actions of our past life, our pride, our selfishness, our sloth, our self-indulgence, our lack of gratitude, our indifference to God and disloyalty. Who could blame anyone for holding us in contempt? Let us then be slow to look down upon another with disdain or judge their motives rashly. For it will be revealed someday and more than likely will be wrong in what we thought at this time. A last lesson is this. Read the lives of the saints or at least the life of a saint regularly. See what they did and what God did in them that lasted. And you will know what needs to be done in your life. To sum up in a word Remember God and he will remember you on the last day. He will make all your virtues and good works overshadow any wrongs we may have committed. Remember God and he will remember you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.